thanks for taking out time and joining this call uh, uh we have with us uh, you know the management from uh, arman financial which is repo- uh, which is represented by uh, alok uh, vivek and amit bhai uh, so uh, so so you know without wasting further time i will hand over to uh, alok patel who's the ed uh, he'll take us through the performance of the quarter and the key trends which are visible on the ground and post that we can have a Q&A session. So over to you, Alok. Thanks a lot, Dikant. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully, I'm audible to everybody on call. Uh, thank you for joining us for the first quarter investor conference call for fiscal 2019. Uh, Jandra Bhai usually makes the opening remarks, but he is unfortunately traveling today and will not be able to join. However, I'm joined on the call by Vivek and Amit Bhai, as Dikant mentioned. Uh, so, firstly, I'd like to start off with a few announcements. Uh, firstly, we have issued the press release for the past quarter, and hopefully everyone had a chance to review it. If not, it is available on the company's website and on the stock exchanges as well. We have also published the annual report for fiscal 2017-18 last week. The electronic version is also available on our website. If somebody would prefer a paper copy, please drop us a line on the company email and we would be happy to mail you one as well. The AGM of the company is scheduled at noon on 7th September 2018 in Ahmedabad. So we always love to interact with our shareholders during the AGM and we hope to see many of you there. On a sadder note, it's with great regret that I announced the passing of our long-serving independent chairman, Mr. Chinubai Arsha. He passed away on June 6th. Uh, Mr. Shah had resigned from the board a few days before his passing due to, due to his deteriorating health. And after 24 years of un- uninterrupted service, I'm sure he'll be sorely missed by the entire Arman team. Uh, we are definitely grateful for all the guidance he provided to us during his long tenure as the chairman. Uh, the company and the board saw fit to appoint Mr. Alok Prasad, who has kindly accepted the position of non-executive independent chairman in place of Mr. Shah. Many of you that have followed the microfinance industry for a while will be familiar with Mr. Prasad. He was the founder CEO of MFIN, which is the RBI license. SRO for MFIs, a self-regulatory organization. He played a key role on the national level to steer the MFIs out of the AP crisis and into the mainstream financial sector. Sir, I'll do it in 10 minutes. Sir, I'll do Participants, please stay connected while we reconnect the management. Participants, thank you for patiently holding your lines. We have the line for the management reconnected. Over to you, sir.
Yep, I apologize, guys. Uh, operator, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you now. Okay, apologies, everyone. I don't know what happened, but uh, I think the lines got crossed or something like that. Anyway, so as we mentioned, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, our deal with SAF partners for the infusion of equity concluded during the quarter in April. We thank all the shareholders for their support by voting unanimously in favor of the infusion. This infusion will bring much needed tier one capital into the company and shall drive the AUM growth ahead. We have received a total of 50 crores by the way of CCDs, which together with accrued interest shall be converted into ordinary equity shares after a period of 18 months. On a fully diluted basis, this amounts to about 56.7 crores. We are thankful to SAF for their investment and their confidence in the business, and we hope for a long and fruitful partnership ahead. Shifting focus to the results, we are quite pleased with the performance in the past quarter. The total AUM of the company has grown from Rs. 227 crores on 30th June 2017 to almost 454 crores as on 30th June 2018. That is a 2x or a 100% growth over a 12-month period. The growth compared to the prior quarter, which is Q4 FY18, is 7.12% from 423 crores on 31st March 2018 to 454 crores on 30th June 2018. Our biggest achievement in the past quarter was shifting to a 100% cashless disbursement model for our microfinance division. We are pleased to report that as of the month of June, 100% of all disbursements for all three of our divisions is cashless. This move will help us in gaining better control over cash and reduce the risk in our businesses. It will also help us in lowering our operating cost. While this transaction initially impacted disbursements and AUM growth, there were teething issues with operations as well. We feel that this minor short-term pain is well worth the efforts for the long-term benefits of cashless disbursements. We are one of the few MFIs in India that have managed to shift to a 100% cashless disbursement model. Comparing the first quarter versus the same quarter the previous year, that is Q over Q results, the income from operations increased 109% from 14 crore to 29 crores. About 68% of that income was from the microfinance book, while 20% was from the two-wheeler operations, and the balance 12% was from the new MSME segment. Consolidated disbursements for the quarter were 155 crores, up from 99 crores the same quarter the previous year. Profit after tax increased 390% from 94 lakhs to 4.61 crores. The profits in the first quarter the previous year were severely subdued due to, the, due to the demonetization impact. In the past 12 months, we have opened 28 new branches, of which 23 were in microfinance and five were in MSME. We plan to open at least another 20 branches this year, including four in Rajasthan for our microfinance operations. These new branches will initially increase our operating cost ratios, but will boost our future growth prospects. Most of the other figures are included in the press release, so I think it's prudent to move on to the question and answer session. As always, ladies and gentlemen, we are thankful for the whole Arman team for their hard work. Fiscal 18-19 so far looks bright as we head into the holiday season, and we hope for a great year ahead. Thank you once again for all your support, and I would like to open the call for questions. Sure. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Anyone who wishes to ask questions, please press star and 1 on your touchstone telephone. 
We have the first question from the line of Sandeep Agarwal from Nareli Investments. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, hi, Sandeep. Yeah. So, uh, my question, uh, first question is regarding the borrowing. The bifurcation of... Uh, the so bifurcation of uh, borrowing as on 31st June 18 and uh, the carrying interest rate. Uh, so our borrowing is about 375 crores on a consolidated basis. Mm -hmm. uh, weighted average interest rate would be somewhere around 14% all in, so all inclusive, uh, including processing fees and everything. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's about it. So any reason? Uh, for this higher rate of interest, because of so, yeah, a couple of things. Couple of things. First of all, the larger most of the borrowing is towards the microfinance segment. Banks consider that as unsecured. That normally does come up as a at a higher interest rate. The second part of the thing is K. Uh, when we say the borrowing cost, we are not simply talking about interest. So the weighted average interest might only be about 12.5%, uh, but when you add on the sort of hidden cost like uh, processing fees and cash collaterals and other things, the, that cost kind of gets bumped up. Uh, and the third issue is that we have a lot of uh, money that we had borrowed from financial institutions during the earlier years, you can say, you know, about a year ago or a year and a half ago or something especially after demonetization when, you know, the banking support sort of wavered for a, a few quarter, quarters. Uh, so financial institution money always comes at a little bit more expensive price. Uh, okay. So as we shift focus towards the banking, bank borrowing, that cost will normally come down. Now, okay. uh, to a certain extent, we can pass on this added cost to our borrowers that is not, that's never a good strategy, of course, but, uh, you know, the RBI formula allows us to lend 10% our cost of borrowing. Uh, and there's a ceiling to it, of course, but uh, so uh, right now we are in a favorable position that this higher cost, we can pass it on to the customer, especially in the microfinance side, but that's never a good strategy. So our strategy is always to reduce the cost of uh, funds as much as we can. And we are working on increasing our ratings and everything as well. So I think in the following quarters, that should come down. Is there any plan to reduce it uh, in uh, financial 19 and 20? Which... Reduce the... Uh, cost, 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 average cost, average cost. Yeah, right? yeah, of course, of course, of course, yeah. I mean, uh, see, the thing is, okay, let's take I have a, I have a 50 crore loan disbursement at 12% today. So that is not yeah. going that will have a slow impact, you know, on my overall weighted average because I got loans which I took at, you know, 15% two years ago, uh, if you get my point. So that yeah. impact will come, but it will come a little slowly, that's it. As the old, more expensive loans run out, uh, they are replaced by cheaper sort of funding, so that will uh, come down in the future quarters. Okay. Um, uh, so my next question is regarding the net interest margin. So in June 17, it is uh, approximately 17.31%. And uh, in June 18, it's 14.9%. So what is the sustainable uh, net interest margin for our company? The the, the names you're talking about, right? So I think net in interest margin. Quarter, yeah, so okay. in the last quarter, it was about 14.9%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what were you saying? Uh, in, so in June, in June, June 17, 17 is uh, 17. Uh, it is 17.31 uh, percent. That is just simply because of leveraging. So during the Q1 of FY18, uh, you know our portfolio had reduced quite significantly. Uh, you know, so more of our portfolio was being serviced by our equity. So that was sort of artificially bringing up the net interest margin or net. Uh, okay. Now, as the leveraging keeps increasing, that pressure on NIM will continue to increase. I would say that right now we are almost fully leveraged. Well, not with yeah. Yeah, with the SAF investment coming in, we have CCDs, but those CCDs still re 
uh, for 18 months they'll still accrue interest. So okay. I would say that we are almost fully leveraged at this point. So I think about four, between 14 and 15 should be the uh, standard expectation going forward. Okay, sir. Uh, so, uh, so last question is regarding uh, AUM group. So in uh, the quarter on quarter basis, in September 17 is 30%, December 17 is 22%, then now June 18 is 7%. So my question is regarding the expected growth rate uh, in AUM in financial 18, 19 and 19, 20. See, last year was an outlier. So I don't think that you should consider growth in last year because as I said, when demonetization of November 2016 hit, we stopped disbursements for about four months. So after that, when, when we started dispersing again, we had all of this infrastructure in place where we could disperse quite fast, and the portfolio reduced by about 40%. So there was a large increase. I mean, we went from, I think, uh, 183 crores to, uh, Vivek, correct me if I'm wrong, about 390. Uh, almost 400 crores in the past fiscal year. So, but that was an outlier year. Typically, we target with consolidated growth, we target about 40% year over year, and that is historically proven correct. Uh, this year, we are targeting somewhere around 50% uh, growth, uh, and we are on target of reaching it. The first quarter, the growth was a little low because of our basically our decision to change into a cashless model. And the other okay. reason was because it was Q1. Okay. So if you look at our company and many other companies, April is always sort of a soft, uh, you know, and I cannot prevent it as much as I try. April disbursements are always quite a bit lower because, you know, the year's over, people take a breather, uh, and as much as you push them, it's, it's always on the lower end. And then by June of this quarter, we had shifted to 100% cashless. Now, many people, I don't know how familiar you are with the microfinance industry, but there are very few MFIs that have managed shifting to a 100% cashless model. And uh, essentially, we had to put our foot down and say, okay, you know, we've been trying to shift cashless for a year. Until you put your foot down and say, okay, this is the only way we'll disperse, otherwise we won't disperse. Uh, operations is always going to come up and say, okay, uh, you know, okay, let's give us more time or let's keep it that way. So that's why the disbursement with, uh, yeah, uh, that's why the disbursement was a little bit subdued during the first quarter. And we have opened up some 15 odd new branches in the last quarter as well. So those take about two to three months to start yielding results. So starting from this quarter, you will start seeing uh, a better growth or more growth on the, at least on the MFI side. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Sure. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to our participants that you may press star and one to join the question queue. The next question is from Shavi Jain from 2.2 Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, this is Amit Mantri. Uh, so, uh, Alok, uh, you know, over the last one year, there has been a significant increase in branches, loan book, and people uh, in the organization. So, can you speak a bit about the management bandwidth uh, that the company has built to ensure that it has the capacity to grow uh, at the pace that you're planning over the next uh, one to two years? And have you added uh, experienced people essentially at the senior level? Yeah, so I think, uh, so first thing what we do, Savi, is that, uh, I'm sorry, Amit, uh, Savi, yes. not, uh, Amit, right, am I correct? Yes, so, yes, yes. So first thing we do, Amit, is that all three of our divisions on an operation level are quite separate. Mm -hmm. And so each, uh, each division, whether you talk about micro, SME, or two-wheeler, uh, that has their own sort of uh, structure from an HR perspective, from a management perspective, and they, own, they each have their own chief operating officer, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So operations are divided. It's only on the upper management side, uh, you know, where I'm concerned or some of the common functions are concerned, like Vivek, who's CFO, and, and, and the key management people. 
uh, that's only the functions which are shared. Uh, the second part is yes, we have been adding a lot of uh, new people, including management, managerial level people, both middle management and upper management as well. Uh, you know, Vivek uh, joined on board uh, about Diwali last year, so it's been about a good three odd quarters. Uh, we just, you know, hired a, an IT person uh, we, uh, for for heading the IT side. Uh, what else? Uh, we, risk. Uh, we are we are looking for a chief risk officer as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the chief operating officer. We have issued ESOPs to encourage people to kind of stick with us. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think you are aware of the ESOPs, and they have been quite popular. In mm -hmm. Uh, taking as many steps as we can, uh, but you know, investing after systems and HR and stuff, you know, is a bottomless pit. <laughs> There's always more people that you need than you have. So the idea is to kind of find the right balance and rest assured that we uh, we are certainly aware of the fact that we do need proper systems in place. <laughs> uh, the, we are taking a lot of steps. Another thing which we are doing is we are shifting to a new ERP software mm -hmm. called eFeed. So that will, uh, you know, that will help us with a lot of control aspects because it's, it could be kind of an end-to-end -end solution, you know, starting from when you first shake hands with the customers all the way to... Uh, uh, you know, until the NOC is issued and everything in between regarding, you know, insurance, HR, all of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is, uh, this is sort of a little bit uncharted territory for all of us, so uh, uh, let's hope we don't screw it up. Huh? Okay. And and uh, you, you had mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the last... Uh, while demonetization had led to some, you know, tapering down of growth rate for the industry, uh, now, you know, we're beginning to see again the euphoria return to the MFI industry with even big and smaller players also getting equity funding and everyone now uh, planning to grow at a fairly aggressive pace. So just want to understand how do you expect, you know, lending discipline and asset quality to pan out uh, given uh, we're again back in that, uh, you know, euphoric period? Um, yeah, you are right, it's there, but the thing is, Casey, we, we get a lot of statistics from the credit bureau and things like that. So if you look at customers on a pan-India level who have, like, according to the credit bureaus, over one lakh of uh, indebtedness, at least in the microfinance space, I mean, you're talking about 3, 4, 5 percent, something like that, you know, so... Uh, People are finding, people are having hard targets, but I don't think everybody is going after the same customer. Eventually, they'll have to find a new customer base. But that being said, there are a lot of MFIs who are planning IPOs and things, and, mm -hmm. you know, when people are planning IPOs, mm -hmm. I guess uh, you guys would know better than me that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you have to show a high growth to justify certain valuations that you're looking for, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the simple answer is I'm not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it seems right now that people are disciplined mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully sort of we have learned our lesson from the demonetization, even though 90% of it, I guess, wasn't our fault. Mm -hmm. But definitely there was a correlation between the defaulting customers and the customers' uh, indebtedness you know, when we ran that, all of those numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody is quite aware of it. And if you look at the companies that have suffered the most, uh, uh, the, the ones that suffered the most were the ones that have had the highest growth rate in the last two, in the yeah. two, three years previous to demonetization. True, true. So true. I would imagine that any board that is worth his salt or any risk person that is worth his salt would take cognizance of that fact that the ones that were impacted the worst were the ones that had the high growth rate and they would try to control the growth rate at a board level. Uh, then again, uh, you know, it's a free market and a free enterprise. 
uh, I don't think from, from an industry level there is very little that we can do except to make sure that everybody is following the RBI norms. Okay. And, you know, in MSME business, uh, you know, you have a fairly uh, unique model of, you know, doorstep collections. Uh, so just wanted to understand uh, who, who are your competitors? Who else does this kind of, uh, uh, you know, lending in your uh, job, in the geographies that you operate on, operate in? Do other NBFs or uh, uh, MFIs uh, do this kind of lending? There are a couple of them. Uh, I think uh, our biggest competitor who follows our, you know, that has the similar rural kind of cash collection model is Fullerton, uh, at least in the geographies that we operate in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than that, I, there are other players that are there that are doing slightly higher tickets as far as lap loans and stuff is concerned. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that is really the only large-scale competitor that we run across in the MSME space. Uh, the SFBs have started doing it to a certain extent, but the volumes aren't large enough yet. But in a quarter or two, I think the significant competition in this space will come from the SFDs. Okay. Because no. everybody is trying to sort of, especially the SFB guys, they're trying to diversify their own uh, loan books. And uh, it seems that everybody I talk to is thinking about going into a MSME. But the thing is that the MSME is a really broad term, you know. It starts anything under 50,000 people consider as micro. Yeah. And then the next level is MSME, which is everything from 50,000 to maybe even right. 5 crores. Mm-hmm. So that's a huge, like, margin over there. I think we need to invent another term for, uh, you know, splitting up MSME into uh, different slices mm-hmm. of, of lending. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. I mean, it's a new space, but so far our experience has been uh, touch wood quite nice. Overall, the segments that we are dealing with, uh, you know, the loan sizes continue to remain smaller than we anticipated. Uh, mm-hmm. So the average loan sizes, while I expected it to be around 1 lakh, it's closer to about 50,000 or so, 50, 60,000, 60,000 mm-hmm. probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the recovery is quite nice. I mean, uh, it's Hard to believe, but out of some 14,000 odd customers that I have, I have 28 of them which are overdue. Uh, The NPA for MSME is only 2.47 lakhs. Mm -hmm. And so these are quite amazing numbers. I just hope I can continue with it for as long as possible. Hello, Savi here. So here, uh, you know, in the MSME, what is the average tenure of the loan? MSME average is about, so about 95% are 24 months. We do have a lower tenure product of 12 and 18 months, but there are not a lot of takers for that. And not a lot of people qualified for it also because of the, you know, the cash flow analysis and everything. So you have already reached the second cycle in some of the customers because you started this more than, uh, you know, some time back, I think. So, right, right. So we have reached, uh, there are a few customers who are coming for second cycle, but those are uh, not a very large volume yet because, you know, the earlier customer, we, it was just a pilot at that phase. And the second cycle, we are bumping up their loan sizes to a certain extent, but uh, overall they still have to go through the same underwriting process. So it's not like the microfinance product, ke, you know, de diya wapis, if they have repaid this, 25,000, give them 30. As they have repaid 30, give them 40 kind of a thing. It's not like that. Uh, it's only if they qualify for it are we actually servicing the second cycle clients. Right. And second was question was on your, uh, you know, on the liability side, what is the breakup now between banks and other institutions? I think it's about... It's, about 50, yeah, 5% from the banks. 55% banks and about 45% will be financial institutions, roughly speaking. The, the ratio is like the remaining 50 50 over a period. Yeah, right. This has uh, changed over the last one, two years, or has it been the same? So there was a time that uh, post demonetization, we were making real good headway, uh, converting a lot of the financial institutions into banks. 
I think we had even reached to a level of 65% banks. Yeah. Then post demonetization, all of a sudden the funding from the bank side was temporarily stopped. Uh, and so again, the financial institutions kind of came into the picture. Uh, I mean, I'm not complaining, you know, definitely uh, we have a, uh, they support us during times we need us and they give a quick turnaround. Bank funding is, uh, Savi is a little undependable in the sense that if you have a proposal with them, especially what's going on in the banking industry uh, right now, uh, as you are well aware, due to NPAs and stuff, uh, you know, there's a diffusion fatigue happening at the banks. So uh, a lot of times if you have a proposal, it might get done in a month, it might take three months, it might take six months or it might go into limbo for 12 months. The, the predictability for the cash flow side is not there. And that makes it quite difficult because I cannot stop my operations. Uh, you know, I need that constant stream of cash coming in. So I don't think that dependability on the financial institutions will ever completely go away. Uh, but ideally speaking, if we can make it 70-30 or 75-25, that, that will be, a, I think, a win-win for everybody. So among the financial institutions, it's mostly NBFCs or you, you call some other kind of entities also? They are mostly all NBFCs. We do have an NCD transaction from a foreign NCD transaction for about 33 crores. Other than that, it's all NBFC work. Right. But the, even, you know, after this equity raise, you did not see... Uh, interest from banks because we had we would have expected uh, banks to you know after this equity raise at least uh, be comfortable giving more money to you. yeah so PSUs are see a lot of the PSU have put a hold on funding MFI second part is we have seen a lot of sort of increased interest if you may uh, from the banking side uh, especially from the private banker side but honestly speaking, during the first quarter, we were sitting on more cash than we needed. In fact, we had to put a lot of money in liquid funds. So we sort of lost money because we had large debt transactions that came in in the last quarter, which is what usually happens because banks are PSL targets to make. And, uh, you know, the SAF money came in in April. So all of a sudden, we are flush with funds, you know, some 110 odd crores coming in in one go. Uh, so we had, you know, we filled up our CC limits and still there was some money left in liquid funds as well. And now we are finally covered up. So uh, even we will start fundraising soon from the debt side. Uh, but yes, the interest has increased and we are working on in the rating exercise as well. We are expecting a rating upgrade. So that should further increase the uh, banker support as well. Right. And just last, last, you know, completing Amit's uh, initial question about, uh, you know, managerial bandwidth at the top level. So, you know, until FI18, at least, you know, if I look at the annual report, just looking at the salaries of the top management, it seems to be, you know, not substantial as compared to any other peers, uh, microfinance companies that are there, you know, including your salary. So, you know, till now we have been pretty small and uh, we managed, uh, you know, with with the with with you we at the helm and uh, you know your your father has also been there, but now that we are growing at this kind of rate, uh, do you think you will need to you know pay pay up to get talent uh, to, to the company because till now at least till FI 18 that does not seem to be the case. So it is. Yeah, let me tell you. Okay, you're right. First of all, I, I don't know if you have accounted for. Because there are some of us that draw salaries from both Arman and Namra. So I don't know if you have accounted for that as, or not. But uh, anyways, you know, our, our strategy on a personal level has always been, KR, it's, you know, we have the most to gain or most to lose out of uh, the company's performance. So uh, we really don't draw more than we kind of need. That's number one. Number two, you're absolutely right that the salary structures in – India in general, if you look at it, are increasing quite fast. But in the microfinance side, you have to understand that we are playing on a labor arbitrage to a certain extent. You know, uh, you, we have to keep the operating cost low enough, otherwise 
you know, the banks can do what we are doing. Uh, I mean, it's not really, I, I don't want to call it, it's an easy business, but the model is in rocket science. But overall, we have an advantage over banks because of our lower salary structure, because we try to standardize the products. Uh, but yes, I think you are right. Going forward, we have already started noticing okay, the, the salary structures are increasing. Uh, one way we try to mitigate that in comparison to, you know, many of the larger MFIs is issuing ESOPs to, you know, pretty much everybody, middle management and above. Uh, so that has helped a little bit, but uh, you are you are correct. Uh, going forward, at least in the upper management, you should you will see an increase in that side. Great, thank you, thank you for answering all the questions. Sure, thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder once again to our participants that you may press star and one to join the question queue. The next question is from Pranav Singh, who is an individual investor. Please go ahead. Congratulations on the good set of numbers. Uh, I wanted to understand our growth plans. Uh, by the end of FY19, what is the asset under management and the number of branches that we expect for MFI and MSME business? So for the MFI uh, book, I think uh, we have... Uh, Somewhere around between four, uh, about 450 to 500 crores in the microfinance side. And uh, the AUMs will hopefully reach around 650 crores, uh, all in, all right? Uh, that's including MSME and the two-wheeler side. Uh, so that is the Muta Muta target for this, uh, this year. Uh, we are a little bit behind because of that cashless thing, but not by much. As for our projections, our EUM should be about 10, 12 crores more than it is. At the, so that we can cover up during the year in the next couple of two or three quarters. Uh, as far as branch opening, we have opened up bulk of our branches during the first quarter. And, you know, it's already August 20th. We have opened up some 10, 12 more branches during the second quarter as well. Uh, probably will open another five odd branches uh, before the end of the second quarter. So in the microfinance side, when we started the year, we had a target of opening about 40 branches, new branches. And on the MSME side, we had a target of opening, uh, I believe, uh, how many we make about about 14 branches, I think. 14 branches now. We've opened three branches and uh, another 10 or so will be throughout kind of throughout the year. Uh, that's the overall plan. As far as disbursements go, uh, we have a target of about 650 crores in the microfinance, about 100 crores in the MSME, and about 100 to 110 crores in the two-wheeler side. Uh, so about 850 crores in total as far as disbursements go. Okay, thank you. Uh, and a follow-up question. Uh, how much time do MSME branches take to stabilize and uh, what is the expected disbursement per branch once they have stabilized? It could really give us an idea. So about 35 to 40 lakhs is where we have reached an average equilibrium after a branch has been in operations for three months or more. Uh, but there are some branches that do about 60, 65, 70 lakhs worth of business in a month. There are others that cannot cross more than 25, 30 lakhs. And so it's been kind of a learning exercise for us as well, okay, which areas and what is the kind of potential of each area before going into it. Going forward, I'm hoping to increase an average, uh, you know, by the end of this year, increasing the average yield of each branch to about 45 to 50 lakhs per month. Uh, that is the target for the disbursement side. Uh, but at least at a minimum, you are looking at two to three months before a branch stabilizes and is generating good yields. 
And sir, so what are uh, our plans for loan against property business? We were thinking of starting that business. Uh, there are, uh, you know, I kind of, it's still on the works. It's still there. But you know, a lot of this, uh, I've been hearing, I, I haven't been hearing very good things about the lap side and the affordable housing side. Uh, so, uh, you know, I decided to wait another quarter until I get some more information on this, on the lap product. Uh, hopefully by, you know, early next quarter, I'll, I would have made a better decision. Let me just put it that way. Or a more informed decision. Yeah, sure. Uh, sir, and uh, congratulations once again on having cash at this first and taking the big bank. I've not been gotten there yet. Uh, could, you give, Thank you. could you give some colors on could you give some color on what uh, advantages are there for uh, cashless disbursements for us uh, going forward? Uh, because people don't talk uh, you, about it. I'm having a hard time hearing or understanding you. Can you uh, talk from the receiver, perhaps, if you're on speakerphone? Oh, no, I'm talking from receiver, and I'll speak loud, actually. Yeah, I'm calling from the U.S. So, uh, I was saying... Uh, could you uh, give some color? Could you uh, on what are the advantages of cashless disbursements for the company in the long term? Well, you know, see, the more when you're dealing with cash, you got to keep a lot of cash-based controls on the field level. So, on the first side, we have to withdraw large amounts of cash and get them to the branches, which is a large risk. Then to ensure that everything is the way it's supposed to be. I have to keep essentially maker-checker systems all over the place, you know, and I have to keep a very lengthy kind of a, a HR structure where everybody is kind of looking at everybody else. It's like, you know, sort of like running a casino, but, you know, in a less fun way. Uh, the, 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 so... Hopefully, by that way, the operating cost will reduce, A. Number two, it also reduces the risk of something going wrong, both from my staff perspective and also from the member perspective. So the risk of ghost loans, for example, goes away to, to, to a minimal level because I'm transferring it directly to the bank account. In many cases, there are intermediaries in the microfinance space as well, uh, you know, those get mitigated to a certain extent. So there are a lot of, you know, tangible and intangible benefits for the cashless model. Earlier it was at a point where everybody said, yeah, oh, you know, cashless is the way to go, but unfortunately the customers that we deal with are not capable of going cashless. But I guess one advantage out of demonetization that came out is that, uh, you know, everybody including my competitors, saw the need to move to a cashless model. So earlier it was hard, unless everybody decided it to, you know, okay, this was a priority. I could not be the only one that said, okay, I'm going to move to a cashless model because the customers, very frankly speaking, still prefer cash. Uh, what they, uh, but, you know, since the competitors are also trying to move to a cashless model, uh, it it uh, really helps me because you know now they don't have a choice but to move to a to the bank based model. In many cases, these guys do have accounts, but they are lying dormant or something. So they just have to put in some efforts to get them active again, and uh, we we transfer the funds directly into their bank accounts. Uh, hopefully, they realize the benefits of it and they start using the bank accounts. You know, and eventually, in let's say two, three years, I can start collecting the money through the bank accounts as well. So that will be a win-win for everybody. But let's see, it was a monumental effort to switch to a cashless disbursement. I think we are quite far away from a cashless collection as of today. Uh, but it is very dynamic. Uh, you know, let's wait two, three years and see what happens. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh I was hearing uh, to a uh, managing director of a large customer lending company who was saying we are growing at a very fast pace, but our asset quality is improving. 
That is happening because our repeat customers are existing. Business from repeat customers is, is increasing. Whenever that happens, your asset quality improves. So I was wondering what is our customer retention ratio and uh, what are our thoughts on improving it? So any customer that is, uh, let's say, a customer in the microfinance side, so I'm talking about only microfinance right now, uh, mm -hmm. out of 100 customers who have finished their loans, last quarter we lent money to about 40 of them. So that's about 40%. Now, in many aspects, uh, that is on the lower side, <coughs> but we have to, you know, we consider a lot of aspects. So, the first part is, does the customer want a loan? You know, what was, uh, maybe he doesn't need a loan. So, right there, there's a dropout there. The second part is, based on his performance, do we want to lend him the money? You know, we track his attendance, we track uh, whether, you know, he has defaulted or been late or overdue for a few days or whatever it is. So that's, that's the second level of filtering that goes there. The third level is this credit bureau. So automatically, if he has over leveraged with some other banks or financial institutions, uh, right there and then you either by my own uh, underwriting or through RBI policy, I have to reject the customer downright. So once you get through all of those filtering, we are left with about 40%. The idea is to, you know, increase it as much as 100% because if it's a good customer, why would, why would I let him go? I mean, uh, that's a, that's a no-brainer, right? But that's basically the formula that has worked out at least in the last quarter. Uh, let's see what we can do to increase that number, but. Right now, given the underwriting and the filters that we have, that's what the number is coming to, for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. okay. And so we have uh, mentioned in our, uh, our communication that we are looking forward to uh, portfolio assignments and securitization, these kind of uh, ways to raise funds, which I expect right. will reduce our cost of funds. So by when do you right. think they'll be in a position uh, to take advantage of these private sector guidelines of time? Um, the problem with this securitization and the assignment of debt is that you need to have a sufficiently large pool of assets to sell. Uh, that means that those assets which are unencumbered with the banks. Now, when a bank is, let's say, lending me 1 crore rupees, they ask for you know, 110% margin, for example. You know, In that case, I have to pledge uh, 1.1 crore worth of assets with them. So, and if you consider that with all the banks or financial institutions, it's it's hard to have a sufficiently large enough pool uh, to sell. Uh, but that being said, with the additional in equity infusion from SAF and stuff, which is you know which doesn't require any assets, we are building up a larger pool. And uh, once it reaches to, let's say, 50 to 75 crores, uh, we can explore a securitization transaction. Uh, we are already in talks with a couple of people. And uh, uh, my interest is to doing it at a lower, you know, at a lower cost than my cost of borrowing. So that way I earn a little bit of extra margin. So my purpose of doing securitization or assignment of debt is not exactly for shifting some of the debt off balance sheet, you know, because right now I'm sufficiently capitalized and my, uh, you know, my tenure of my loans is average is just about 14 months. So doing a securitization for off balance sheet funding purposes doesn't make a lot of sense for me. But if I can increase my margins and hence my profitability, if the uh, you know, if I'm able to do the transaction at a lower cost than my cost of borrowing all in, then it only makes sense for me to do it. So uh, we are working on it, the short answer is, but it will take some more time. Thank you very much. We'll take that as the last question. I would now like to hand the conference back to Mr. Degantharia for closing comments. Hi, uh, thanks all for taking out time. Uh, thanks, Alok, and uh, uh, you know, wish you all a very pleasant evening. We'll join again uh, next quarter. Uh, thanks to everyone.